Hello, and a very warm welcome to this Zephyr Project Mini Summit. Uh, my name is John Round, and I'm going to be covering the introduction today for the other speakers and for the other topics that we're going to be presenting. Now, if you would like to uh, glance, this is the, uh, the list of folks that are going to be presenting with us today. And it's a warm welcome to all of them uh, for taking the time out to, uh, to present. But also a warm welcome to everyone who's maybe new to Zephyr and watching this presentation for the first time or just learning about Zephyr. Um, but also not to forget the number of people who've been participating in the Zephyr project over the last uh, several years and have really got Zephyr to where it is today. So a warm welcome to all of you. Now, no project would be complete without a vision statement. And uh, four years ago, roughly now, uh, Zephyr started as uh, an RTOS project. And some people at that time would say, is there an requirement for yet another RTOS uh, project? And the answer for that is yes, when you start to look at the uh, details uh, and the way the market's changing, uh, we feel that there was a real demand for a real open source, open governance RTOS project. And the success of Zephyr really is uh, reinforcing what we were thinking at the time and indeed uh, what many others uh, were thinking as well. Now, when we look to the facets of Zephyr, what makes Zephyr different, what makes Zephyr interesting, um, Number one, it's an open source project. Now, many projects claim to be open source. Uh, this is an open source project housed under the Linux Foundation, and we're going to talk a bit about that later on. But it's very important to say open source as a word on its own is not extremely important. It can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, but when we talk open source and we talk community, we talk permissive licensing, and one of my uh, personal uh, beliefs open governance. So when we talk about an open source project and we talk about Zephyr, we're talking about many facets for a project which we think are fundamental and extremely important. And as I said in the introduction, now we believe many people agree with us if, when we look at the support that Zephyr is getting. Now, architectures, well, we support most of the main architectures. Again, this is a community project. So I was always told that when someone asks me, oh, do you support this architecture? The answer is, if we don't, we'd be delighted to have you participate and add that support. So we're on the leading architectures. It's increasing all the time. And in fact, if you look to the number of board level products that we've got, uh, there really is a significant catalog. And boards are all about getting people started. And if you look to this catalog, um, I look in the middle actually, the micro bit, we really are starting at the lowest price point, but with good functionality. So when you can put Zephyr onto one of these development boards and have a Bluetooth mesh running within literally your first hour of engagement, I think not only have we created a functional RTOS platform, but we have created a platform that can get people started and give a range of solutions out there. Now, I look at this uh, type of board and now what you're seeing is Zephyr sh shipping as default on these boards. So these e-paper conf badges, etc. what does it do? It lowers the barrier to entry. It allows people to play with Zephyr, it allows people to get involved. And that's what community is all about. It's all about building that community involvement. Now, as I bump into my animation. One of the comments that was on the first slide about our mission statement, and I said, why Zephyr? Why another Artos? Well, one of the comments there was functionality. We didn't want just an Artos. We wanted an Artos that had a high level of functionality, but also was designed for constrained devices. Fundamental to our mission was safety and security. So again, as we looked at the RTOS world, these were not facets, behaviors, or capabilities that we could see in open source platforms that had full open governance. What you see here is a modular architecture, 
and it's a modular architecture for a reason. It was designed to expand. It was designed to accommodate new functionalities. It was designed to move away from getting a kernel and then figuring out what USB stack or what BLE support you would add to it. It was meant to be a package, a bundle of tested modules. Then we could look to security, we could look to safety. In other words, as this project expanded, it brought a great deal more than just an RTOS platform to the world. Now, when you look here, what you'll see is a selection of the type of functionality that is enabled. Um, there are really uh, an expanding library at all times. If you go check the website, and there's going to be some discussion from the other speakers. But again, this is a community effort. So if you see something that's missing, consider yourself a volunteer, because that's what we are looking for. We're looking for participation to just grow this diagram and grow the capabilities of Zephyr. Now, I'm not going to read this list. Uh, in fact, I don't know even if you can see that text. That is a good thing. These are the number of companies that have been participating in the Zephyr project over the last 12 months. Now, where we started from, well, we started from zero. We started from a vision statement. As I said, look at the number of people who now are sharing that vision. And it's not just about sharing. Community projects are about participation. They're about getting involved. And what we can see here is a huge list of people and companies getting involved. The, the way I tend to promote this to people is to say you could never afford this level of capability and size of engineering team for your company, maybe some of the bigger ones, but then you wouldn't have the richness of the community project. So when you look at this level of participation and we have several graphs showing up and to the right, this just keeps getting bigger and that's people participating in the project. Here, again, it's not a competition. There's no way that we're going to have a world with only a single Artos. But as a board member and with the other board members, um, what does this do? This tells us that that vision is shared. That's not a marketing statement. It's not a promotional comment. This is a way for us tangibly to see what is actually happening. And what you can see here, and those, this number continues to rise, is as more people get involved, uh, the project just gets better. And that's, again, the plus of a community project. Now, this is a slide I think is particularly important. And when you look, I mentioned at the start, to open source projects, many people will claim, well, my project is open source. Um, and really what that means is you can access the source code, but then the first thing you have to do is check the license. Um, Zephyr is an open source project, but it has the other extremely important piece, which is open governance. Uh, and I have to say, I've had involvement with the Linux Foundation uh, on and off over the years. They do run an extremely good project. In other words, we have structure, we have transparency, we have openness, we have code of conduct. In other words, we have a project that's properly managed. Unlike some of the more proprietary entities who may put something in the roadmap, may remove it from the roadmap you may not have, have no ability to influence the roadmap. That's what an open source project is about. It's about you, it's about community, and that participation means you're a full participant. You're a full participant in this project as it evolves and as it's delivered. You can get involved today. You can add your devices today. So. The Linux Foundation gives us a very strong governance framework. I must say it's just nothing but a, a delight to participate in, and I can talk for my other board member colleagues. Um, and when you look to the technical steering committee and the community, the highest level, the highest level of competence and the highest level of inclusion. Now we look to the members, and quite frankly, the membership continues to grow. These are some great companies, some great people, and it's a great experience really to be involved with them all. Here's the web links, which are part and parcel of this. If you want to get involved, there's, all of us are more than happy to talk to you, but please reach out and look to these web links if you want more information. Now, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Marty Bolivar, 
and he's going to talk to you about waste. Marty. Thank you. Hi, so my name is Marty Bolivar. I'm a Zephyr and a West developer, and I'm here to talk to you about West. I suppose that this is one of the early talks in the order because this is one of the early tools that you're going to run into when you're using Zephyr. So if you've already gone through the Zephyr Getting Started guide, you'll see kind of how West fits into getting started. But if you haven't, that's totally OK. It's not required, and there's a link. What is it, though? At its heart, it's an extensible command line tool for managing a workspace. Breaking that down, a workspace is just a directory with Git repositories inside. That's it. Extensible here means that West is built around subcommands, and you can add new subcommands without changing the source code itself, so it's pluggable. The other thing that you should know about West is that it is not a requirement. You know, we put it into the Getting Started Guide because it is the easiest way to get going, but people do use Zephyr without it. We maintain documentation for how to do so. And if you're looking for the source code, it's got its own repository under the uh, Zephyr Project Artos GitHub organization. So let's see a little bit more in terms of how it breaks down in terms of the core West and then the things that Zephyr does with it. So like I said, West sort of proper in the West repository is built around managing your workspaces. It has a configuration system, and then it has some Python APIs for extensibility. And it's in Python because all of Zephyr scripts are written in Python for um, running on all platforms. Then in terms of Zephyr, there's sort of two main ways in which it gets used. One is for modules. And in the context of Zephyr, what a module is, is it's a third party project or Git repository that has some functionality that needs to get integrated into the Zephyr build system for whatever reason. It could be an SOC hardware abstraction layer. It could be an implementation of a file system, what have you. And then on top of that, we've got some extension commands, which use those APIs to do Zephyr specific things like building applications, flashing and debugging applications. And those all live in the Zephyr source code repository. So let's talk a little bit more nitty gritty about kind of the, the main commands, your bread and butter commands that you're going to deal with. The first one is West init, and that's what you're going to use to create a workspace. Um, the main things that you feed West init are where you want it on your local file system, in this case, Zephyr project, where you want to sort of initialize from, in this case, the upstream Zephyr repository, and what revision you want to start at, in this case, version 230, which is the most recent release from this month. What it's going to create for you is your workspace directory, Zephyr project. And then underneath it, it's going to have cloned the Zephyr repository, which happens to contain this YAML file. Uh, the Zephyr project is the, is the topter or the workspace root. And the um, West configuration file says that West.yaml lives in this Zephyr directory. So what is inside of here? Well, the West.yaml file is basically just a list of projects. And if you kind of take a look at line nine, that projects list, you can see we've got a file system, we've got a bootloader. It's, it's basically just a list of Git repositories, where to check them out on the local file system, and um, some additional metadata like what revision to check out. I want to kind of uh, zoom in on this from a more 10,000 foot view. So it really is basically just think of it as a list of projects. And every element of this list is a pointer to a Git repository. In upstream Zephyr, we've got all of these under the Zephyr Project Artos GitHub organization, um, mainly so that we you know, can't lose track of them. URLs aren't going to change around us from underneath our feet. But when you're building with Zephyr, this is totally customizable. You can point this at wherever you want. It doesn't have to be on GitHub. You can host your own Git repositories anywhere. So once you've got your workspace set up, the next sort of bread and butter command that you're going to deal with as a Zephyr developer all the time is West update. And you may have noticed that when you initialize the workspace, it didn't have any of those other repositories, any of those other dozens of repositories. Well, that's what West update is meant to do. And so when you run West update, it's going to look inside of the .west directory, find the config file, find your west.yaml file, notice all those projects, and then kind of figure out what it needs to do. So in this case, you've just initialized. You don't have anything. It's going to clone your bootloader. It's going to clone the fat file system implementation. It's going to put everything in the right place. It's going to check out the right revisions. So all the modules in west.yaml are placed under the workspace root in a directory called modules. Um, and that's where your vendor house and your file systems, et cetera, are going to live. Now, one kind of important distinction to keep in the back of your mind is that not everything is a module. So for example, we've got a repository that is a bootloader, which is an application. That's not a module. 
Um, another example would be there's a repository that contains a variety of tooling that's used for networking with Zephyr. And there's no Zephyr source code there. That's all host tooling. So although it's a project, it's not a module. Moving along, um, there's here's some just some pointers to workspace management commands. I don't want to dwell on these, but the point here is that there's a variety of other ways that you can interact with your workspace. And if you want to know more about them, turn to the online help. So you run West Help, and it'll print you kind of a list. It looks a little bit like this. It'll tell you the name of each of the built-in commands. It'll give you a one-line help for them, and it'll tell you how to get more information. Uh, the slides also there, they have a link to uh, the Zephyr documentation online. And let's get a little bit moving on from there over to the extension commands. Now, the, sl the previous slide contained the built-in commands that are developed in the West repository. You're also going to deal a lot with these extension commands that have source code in the Zephyr repository. And one thing to keep in mind about all these is that because West is optional, these are just wrappers, right? So when you run West build to build your application, uh, like you'll see in the Getting Started Guide, really that's just a convenience wrapper around the Zephyr build system. The Zephyr build system is built on CMake and Ninja or GNUMake, and um, you know it's a totally standard. You know we're not reinventing the wheel here, uh, but there's just a variety of commands that kind of make it easier to get started with and easier to use um, for many people. Sort of similarly, uh, those of you who are very familiar with embedded development will know that there's a ton of different tools out there for flashing and debugging. And one of the things that you'll need to do when you get a new board is you have to figure out what they are and you know how to use them. And often, it'll be multiple commands chained together, or you have to maybe write a configuration file. So because that's kind of a barrier for entry, West uh, and the Zephyr build system have some integration to let you declare as the board porter, here's how I want my board to be flashed. So somebody can then just run West build, and then your users can just say West flash. And because that's all taken care of behind the scenes, the build directory has all the metadata necessary to declare how to actually flash the target. Uh, I, I include this slide just because a lot of times you'll get this issue when you're just getting started. If you see invalid choice build, you're probably not running it inside your workspace. If you see that issue in, in, in practice, I, I get this one a lot. So I'm just avoiding myself a little support here with apologies to the Linux Foundation for wasting time. Uh, all right, moving right along. So we've covered, we've covered workspaces. We've covered a bit of the extension commands. We've covered kind of the bread and butter commands. There's one final command that I'll just mention briefly, and that's westconfig. Uh, we saw earlier that there's a .west slash config, and that's where your local configuration is. Some, another thing to kind of keep in the back of your mind for later is that you can also set configuration user and system-wide, and there's plenty of documentation for that just in case you're managing multiple workspaces. Uh, finally, I'll sort of finish with help and troubleshooting. Uh, we do have a, a lot of documentation, um, both in HTML form, um, also in PyDoc form, since West has APIs, you can you know, use the Python interactive interpreter if you're writing your own extensions. Um, then there's command line help. Uh, if you say West help, like I mentioned earlier, that lists everything, and that's extension aware. So if you're inside your workspace, it'll give you help for build. Uh, the second line, unfortunately, I noticed a typo this morning. It's not West command help. It's West help command. Uh, so you can see kind of in the, the indent, it says West help init. That is correct. It is not West init help. I'm sorry. Um, that'll be fixed when the slides are, uh, are finally put online. And then um, the last thing I'll mention about kind of things to keep in the back of your mind to, to sort of unwrap and, and troubleshoot is that any command can be run in verbose mode. So you say west-v for verbose, and then you run the command, and you give it any other arguments. And it'll print out all of the sort of subcommands, like maybe the git commands for workspace management, or maybe all of the CMake commands for building and flashing. So it, it tries to be really transparent. It tries to get out of your way, um, and it tries to be convenient. So with that, I think uh, I'm all done. Uh, thank you. And I'll turn it over, I guess, uh, back to the platform for a video on Bluetooth. Thanks very much. Hello, I'm Martin Woolley from the Bluetooth Special Interest Group, the standards organization behind Bluetooth technology. So I've been invited to give you a 10 minute overview of Bluetooth capabilities and Zephyr. And I think the first thing to note is that Bluetooth is no longer a, a single thing. There are two distinct Bluetooth radio communications technologies. The first is called Bluetooth BR EDR, and that's the original Bluetooth from 21 or so years ago. And then there's Bluetooth Low Energy, which is newer. Uh, Bluetooth BREDR allows you to create point-to-point -point connections between devices for the purposes of exchanging data. Uh, it's a cable replacement technology, really. 
Bluetooth Low Energy though is much more versatile and more power efficient. Yes, you can have those point-to-point -point connections, but you can also broadcast data, which means any number of devices that are in range can receive data that you're broadcasting. And you can create mesh networks using Bluetooth Mesh, a distinct technology in its own right. And Bluetooth Mesh lets you create networks of up to 32,767 devices, and it's designed for things like smart buildings where things like automation and monitoring and control of building systems is really important. But that's not all it's for. Now the stack itself isn't one thing either, it's quite modular and many of the features are now optional. There's always a controller part and a host, so architecturally those are the two main building blocks and they talk to each other via a standard interface. The stack configuration you're seeing on screen is that which you'd probably find on smartphones and all sorts of other peripheral devices. This is for non-mesh networking. Mesh looks completely different though, it uses the same Bluetooth Low Energy Controller at the bottom, but the host has a whole new set of layers specifically for mesh networking. Let's have a look at Zephyr then and find out what support for Bluetooth we have. Well, BREDR uh, is incomplete and its status is deemed experimental. Probably not a lot of demand for Bluetooth BREDR on Zephyr at this stage, I would say. The story is completely different for Bluetooth Low Energy, though, including for Bluetooth Mesh. Bluetooth SIG qualifications exist at specific versions for host and controller for various purposes. And if you're unaware, qualifications are the formal certifications that products must have in their use of Bluetooth. So if you're developing commercial products with Bluetooth, then you must have a look at this. That modularity um, extends to the Zephyr SDK as well. So project properties allow you to select the features that you're going to be using. And obviously this helps keep your code nice and lean. So here on screen, I'm showing you the properties that I've set up for uh, a Bluetooth mesh using device. So I've enabled Bluetooth uh, under the hood. The controller is using connectionless communication uh, or the observer and broadcaster roles as they're known. Um, I've enabled Bluetooth mesh itself and I've indicated that two special uh, roles that nodes can play, that of the relay and the proxy, are not required here. Pretty straightforward, but configuration actually does quite a lot of work for you. Here's an example of a gap peripheral, where again I've enabled Bluetooth, I've enabled SMP, that's a security manager protocol, because I'm using pairing, I've said it's a peripheral, and amongst other things I've enabled elliptic curve cryptography support, because I want to use the best security, which is provided by LE Secure connections. And here's a device that acts as a gap central, so all it does is scan and connect to other devices, uh, and there wasn't much I needed to do in the configuration. Let's have a look at some code. Um, not an extensive review because I'm very short of time, but I want to give you just, just a flavour of what code looks like when using Bluetooth on Zephyr. So this is for, for peripheral devices which typically need to start out by advertising. So I'm creating the, um, the content and structure of the advertising packets, largely using macros, a lot of great macros for use with Bluetooth on Zephyr. Uh, and then I'm making a single function call to start the advertising process. Defining GAT services and characteristics is something you'll very commonly need to do. You can see I've defined a UUID there. I'm not showing all my code here. Um, did that using a macro once again. Then I'm defining my service in terms of the service and its UUID and the characteristics that it contains. And there I've specified the UUID for each of the characteristics, um, what capabilities they have in terms of operations supported, and I've provided references to functions for handling operations on those characteristics and I've specified permissions all in one go, largely taking advantage of macros once again. Then I create the GAT service itself, there's a type there, BT GAT service, and then I register it. So in a few lines of code I can quite quickly define a Bluetooth GAT service and its characteristics and handler functions. Security also is very straightforward to use. You need to know what you want, of course. Bluetooth Low Energy leaves it up to you to decide what your security requirements are and gives you basically a toolbox. Here, what I'm doing is uh, establishing the use of LE Secure connections for pairing uh, with passkey authentication, which gives me man in the middle uh, protection. 
So I have a structure there that defines some callback functions, which I then register. That's for use during uh, the kind of execution of the pairing process. And I then select the type of security you want on a per connection basis. And the constant there, BT Security FIPS, gives me level 4 security that uses LE Secure Connections. FIPS stands for Federal Information Processing Standards, in case you were wondering. And that standard requires you to use LE Secure Connections. I guess that's where the name came from. When developing the code for mesh devices, you tend to be concerned with three things uh, in particular from a Bluetooth perspective. Uh, mesh devices, or nodes as they're known, have a structure. They have a number of addressable parts called elements, and each element implements a number of standardized kind of behavioral capabilities that are called models. So your code will declare those uh, that structure and provide references to functions that will handle message types that are associated with those models. So code probably looks something like this. Again, extensive use of macros there to define an array of the model supported. And then in this case, I have a single uh, element or addressable part for my node. And then you bring everything together with BT Mesh Comp, which is the, the whole node composition. Sending and receiving messages is very straightforward. I haven't shown it here, but you've got network buffer APIs for formulating and kind of extracting data from messages that you receive. So here's a video of a demo I created using Zephyr with 16 separate nodes, each of which is a Nordic thingy. It so happens has an NRF52 module inside it. Um, so it's running Zephyr. I've implemented a couple of model, models that let me turn LEDs on and off and change their color. I've got an Android application using um, one of the nodes as a proxy to talk to the network. We use a publish and subscribe approach to addressing. Um, the different nodes have subscribed to different addresses so I can control subsets of them. So there I've sent a message that turns on all of the LEDs in the grid. And then another one to turn them all off. Now I'm sending different message types to change the color. Again, all to uh, the same address for all of the nodes in my grid. And now I've changed the destination address so that only some of the nodes are responding. So at the Bluetooth Special Interest Group, we have quite a nice collection of educational resources for developers. And a lot of them feature Zephyr. They all cover some aspect of the theory of a given topic and they also have hands-on work in the form of course projects. So the ones I've picked on screen here are the main ones. The one on the left, the introduction to Bluetooth Low Energy Development is really for non-mesh uh, Bluetooth devices and covers all sorts of aspects of that. It's really cool, good fun to, to work with as well actually. The mesh networking one is of course for embedded software engineers who want to develop Bluetooth mesh devices and the Bluetooth Mesh proxy function is also associated with Mesh, but it looks at how you can create applications for smartphones and for web applications that can interact with a Bluetooth Mesh network using something called the proxy function. And then over on the right, we've got the Bluetooth LE Security Study Guide, which will tell you everything about Bluetooth LE Security, its, you know, its features, what those features are for and how they work, but also illustrates what's involved in using them in code using Zephyr once again. So I hope that's been a useful overview. Um, please take a visit to bluetooth.com and have a look at those study guides if you want to know more. I think there's time now for a few questions. Thank you. And there we go. All right, actually the questions will be at the end. Um, after a couple of us present. My name is David Brown, and I'm going to spend a few minutes giving a, kind of an introduction to the Zephyr project and the focus that we have on security within the project. Um, we did, as mentioned by, as John mentioned toward the beginning, we have had a focus on security from the beginning of the project. Um, we'll also get into, um, Kate will cover safety following this presentation. And I uh, just wanted to start by covering what we've done so far in terms of safety, um, or in terms of security. Um, the, the charter for the, the, the project has a security subcommittee, which initially consists of the certain levels of members of the project get a seat on this committee, 
And there's two elected roles. There's the security architect who is responsible for overall project security. That currently is me. And there is a chair who is also elected and is responsible for running the security subcommittee. We have meetings every other week and we go over quite a few things during those meetings. And I'll get into some of that as we get further along in the presentation here. Um, so some of the things as the security subcommittee that we've accomplished, um, we have what's called the Common Infrastructure Initiative Gold status, and there'll be more after that in a minute. Uh, this is a set of best practices that we've worked to achieve within the project. We have registered as a CNA, which is also coming up a little bit, but that's um, the CVE database is a common vulnerabilities and exploits, keeps track of vulnerabilities that are discovered in projects, whether open source or not. And this notion of a numbering authority, as this database grew, it became overwhelming for a single organization to manage assigning numbers and tracking the data in them. And so the Zephyr project has registered as a numbering authority ourselves. We are able to just assign numbers when vulnerabilities come in. And I'll get more into this with our process in a few minutes. We've also started documenting the project security goals, our vulnerability process. So when the, somebody says, oh, I found a bug in Zephyr, what do I do? We have documentation on the website that tells you, well, what do you do? And just one specific thing that I, I like to point out, uh, we did put some work into the randomness and the entropy subsystem. And uh, one of the members of the security subcommittee put some effort and some changes into the code to improve this to make it easier to use correctly. Um, entropy is one of those things where it's really easy to be completely wrong and it looks like it works just fine because predictable numbers work too. They're just predictable and don't give you the security properties that you would like. Um, so back to this uh, core infrastructure initiative best practices program. And hopefully these links will work when the slides go out. Um, if not, Google will find them. And so what this project does is it awards badges based on a project's commitment to security. And it's mostly about the project infrastructure, not as much about the code itself, the project hosting, how the processes work, are they following best security practices? And we achieved, according to their list of qualifications, gold status in February of 2019. And this just gives us a little badge and it, it basically shows that, yeah, we care about security and the, the Linux kernel recently achieved gold status as well. That's probably also something you've seen in the news. So as far as the documentation goes that we've developed, um, there's a link there to their project security overview. Um, we started with mostly documents from other projects. You know, what have other projects learned about security? How do you tell developers how to write secure code? How do you start with a secure mindset? And the idea is it's built around secure development, secure design, as well as security certification. Um, you may be familiar with things such as FIPS 140-2 or 140-3, other types of security standards. And our goal here is to, Zephyr itself may not be something that can be certified because they generally tend to certify prod products, not an open source project. But what can we do as a project to get them as close as possible? And there may be things like pre-certification, things that we're investigating. And this whole process of documentation, security, is an ongoing process. It's not, we just check this off, we're finished, we're done. But as an example, we've decided we need to put some effort into reorganizing the documentation to make it easier to find the things that the how do I report a bug should get its own top level page, this kind of thing. So it, it's definitely an ongoing process. So recently made the news that the, a group called the NCC group sent us a vulnerability report a couple of months ago. And in this were 20 some odd security vulnerabilities that they had found through analysis of the Zephyr code tree. And 
what this brought out to us is that it really showed us that we need to document what do we do when we get vulnerabilities. Up until that point, we had received them occasionally, one at a time, and now we have 20 some. So what do we do? So in the process of going through this, I we also updated the documentation so that additional members can volunteer to be on this team of people triaging these issues. Um, just a summary of, you know, what kind of things are in the process. There's a, a notion of an embargo period. When you report a vulnerability to the Zephyr project, what happens? We don't just publish it. We want to give people who are building products with Zephyr an opportunity to fix them. One thing we've noticed that's a little different than maybe a product oriented, where in many projects you're building the end product and that's what gets shipped to customers and the vulnerability directly affects what you build. In the case of Zephyr, we're presenting a source tree that then others are building a product with. So we needed a bit different of an embargo period. And we came up with this approach of the project having one period of time and then this is shared with certain members, certain people who are then able to have a period of time that they can incorporate fixes before the vulnerabilities are published. And part of this is there's various stages the issues go through. Uh, we have a JIRA system that tracks the security vulnerabilities that allows us to have permissions to make them not generally viewable until they've become public. And working with the maintainers. So we get a vulnerability report. Zephyr's a large enough project that there's no individual that knows about every subsystem. So we have to find who is responsible for this particular piece of code and have them come up with a fix for it. And, and then finally, when the embargo ends, it needs to be disclosed at the end. And we'll get to that just a little bit with the next slide. So there's something known as a PCERT, the Product Security Incident Reporting Team, or Project Security, I think is how we're using it since we aren't making a product. And this is a subset of the security subcommittee. So anyone, each member company gets a, a seat as on the security subcommittee. And then of that, a subset essentially volunteer to be part of this response team. And what the response team does is these are the people that respond to vulnerability reports that are sending them out to maintainers to get things fixed, reporting them to vendors that are building projects. So part of that is this notion of a numbering authority that I mentioned before. The, the, there is a, a large database, it's maintained by MITRE, of these common vulnerabilities and exposures. You've probably seen these numbers. It's a CVE dash, four digit year dash, and then a number that increases. And essentially it's a complicated system for allocating integers, but we get blocks of numbers that we're allowed to then use. And then over time, we have to either publish these or reject them, request new numbers for different years. Um, we've already gone through two allocations thanks to that report so far this year in 2020. So we, this registers us with MITRE and now we issue our own CVEs. As soon as we get a CVE in, I go to a little table and I just pick the next one off of it. And that's the, the number that goes with that issue. Um, significantly, you don't just ask for this. There's a bunch of documentation and process requirements that MITRE has to make sure that you're actually doing the right thing as part of this. So just a little bit of detail. Um, there's a link to the report here. There were around 26 issues, all but one of which directly applied to the Zephyr project. The other issue was to the bootloader that Marty mentioned is one of the, the modules that's there. What we decided to do is to take the critical high and medium, and we made these into tickets. And for the most part, well, actually all of these have been fixed. We have pull requests that have gone in to various releases, and this is all tracked, and there's a set of release notes that describe each of the vulnerabilities and where you can find the fix, what version it was fixed in. If you have an old version that it isn't fixed, where to get the patch to pull in. And the vulnerable, the embargo for this has now passed and everything is updated in the vulnerability report page on the Zephyr documentation. So most of these resulted in one or more CVEs being reported. Um, there's kind of some fun with the CVE rules. Essentially, if a report has 
multiple patches that could be independently applied, they need to get separate CVE reports. So there's a couple of the, the, the reported vulnerabilities that resulted in more than one. And then there were a couple of them that didn't result in a, a CVE at all. Um, one example was the bug was introduced and then fixed before there was a release. So there was no release version that had the vulnerable code in it. So there's nothing to notify anyone about for that. So for the most part, the issues were fixed in a reasonable time frame. Uh, we sent these out, people were quite interested in fixing them. Uh, sometimes the security subcommittee submitted the initial fix. We did have one issue where a fix did not come forward very quickly. And we, it, we basically recommend in the CVE that this feature should just be disabled. Um, another thing, as I mentioned before, the, since the Zephyr doesn't produce a product, we need additional time for this embargo process. So it initially was set to 60 days and we had a proposal with the board to move that to 90 days to give basically 30 days for the Zephyr project to fix it. And then another, th another 60 days for people who are building products out of Zephyr. And sometimes there's an, another party in between there that may be taking Zephyr, building something that then someone else builds a product with. And through all of this, everyone needs extra time before we publish and tell everyone about the vulnerabilities. And this is a process that we hope to continue to improve. It turns out there's a lot of little pieces that are involved with things that expire embargo and need to, you have to track pull requests, just lots of little pieces. And just lastly, uh, we also kind of concluded that there's a need for what we call a vulnerability alert system. And what that comes down to is for the embargo to work, you can't just hide the problem from everyone or there's not really much point in having an embargo. There's parties that need to be notified early. And, and so what this means is when a, a vulnerability comes in, we create this internal issue and we have to have some subset of people, some individuals that get notified about the vulnerability with some level of detail, enough to know that they need to hear some patches you need to apply before this is all made public. So we created this vulnerability registry. And this is initially seeded with the, the members of the Zephyr project, but we, it's an open source, open governance project. There's, you're not required to be a member in order to build products with Zephyr. And we wanted a way to, for these people who are building products to be able to register. And what will happen is information about the vulnerability will become an email and get sent out to this mailing list that covers these people that have registered. And again, I say the goal is to fix issues with thir within 30 days and give vendors 60 days before publication of the vulnerability. So that's pretty much the topic I had for the Zephyr security overview. Coming up next will be Kate Stewart, who's going to give us a little presentation on uh, safety certification in Zephyr. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Kate. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit today about um, the safety certification, what we're doing there. Um, and one of the things I'm gonna ask people is if you've got questions, um, there's a Q&A in this interface. And so if you wanna type your questions in, we'll get back to them all at the end. We've reserved time at the end of this for all the speakers uh, to get together and work with, uh, answer the questions as they've come in. So if you can queue them up right now, that's gonna be really helpful for us at uh, the later part. So when we start Zephyr off, um, this slide was pretty much intact. We, needed, we knew we needed to basically be able to work with the a development community and let features come in quickly and be able to be responsive and add new data, you know, add new functionality and features. But we also knew that we needed to be able to um, work with the, the safety certification folk and be able to um, work through the V model and the um, necessary evidence and safety uh, manuals and so forth that they're going to need to see to have that evidence in place. We pretty much started with 61508 um, in mind because that one 
is a good starting point for a variety of other um, standards in this area. So you can go from 61508 to some of the things for automotive and medical and so forth. And so it was a good starting point when we, when we started thinking about this project. However, we knew we would need to do some intermediate stages, which is something we we're calling our long-term stable, where we basically ratchet down the development. So um, those 10,000 commits a year you're seeing are happening on development. And then every two years we're cutting a long-term stable. And then from there, we're taking a subset of the functionality and that's what we're taking through the safety certification. This way we don't disincentivize the community and we can make sure we have the processes coming in in an effective way. Um, so that's kind of what's been happening in a nutshell. Our long-term stable, we actually cut our first one last year and we've been using it not so much for safety at this point yet, but we have been using it for going after Bluetooth certifications as well as keeping it up to date with any security fixes. So this is where if you wanted to work with something that was a little, you know, didn't want to be working with the development tip for a product, we'd recommend you to go work with this long-term stable and we're putting all the security fixes into it over time and it is not moving as fast as the interfaces are up on the development, the new development's happening. Oops. And um, to sort of illustrate this, this is where we're keeping it up to date. So our long-term stable number one, or which was, was tagged from the 114 release. Um, we've already put out two other releases since then. Um, and if you go to the links, you can sort of go look in our repos, you can see that we have the CVEs uh, listed in the, re in the um, release notes, as well as any of the other fixes that have been um, added into each release. So it's a way of being able to work with what we've got um, and not having quite the same pain, not having quite the same pace of change, um, but you're still up to date on the security, and you can and make sure and like if we find bug fixes, we're putting them in there too. Now the auditable branch, uh, what we're going to be doing with that is we're just going to be taking a subset of what's in the LTS branch, and that's it's the um, modules that were there, going to be there that we're going to be taking through and working through some of the interfaces. In that diagram at the start that John showed, you saw we have a large amount of um, components in there and in the stacks. And it's just going to be a subset we're going to be working from initially. And then over time, we're going to be building it up. The actual um, criteria and certifications um, we're going after is, you know, was initially agreed to be 61508. And then as time progresses, we'll probably be going after others. But that's going to get agreed to with the board and with the various committees to make sure that we're all in line. So as I said, the standards we considered were um, the 61508, but along the way, the, we're going to be working on moving the code base right now this year over to be MISRA um, C2012 compliant. So we're busy working with um, some of the tools that are out there to make sure that the guidelines for our code, um, I'll follow it and we can do the testing and making sure we get ourselves um, literally lined up with it. There's some other things we've been looking at, but um, you can, if you want to get more details on what we've got, um, there's some of the stuff that's been documented in the TSC minutes and the coding guidelines are being published for the project right now. And you'll be seeing the code base transform over to be fully compliant with those guidelines or else all deviations being noted. After that, um, we have a lot of evidence to start assembling um, for going after the 61508. So to do all this work, there's actually a uh, safety committee that meets every two weeks and we started the safety committee off now in last year and we um, are doing these best practices we've been focusing on that and then we're also looking at making sure that the code base doesn't regress so the changes we're making up um, we're making them into the develop tree and we're going to be keeping it going from there so what the key for us is going to be prevent, preventing regressions from happening over time uh, we have weekly coverity scans going on. We have the image of scans being incorporated. And we're looking at various like open source tools to help us with the static analysis, all of which is good for the security perspective as well. But what we're going to be trying to do is making sure we have as hard and code base as we can. And this is pretty much because quality has got to be your, your own 
you know, mandated expectation for this. Um, we were lucky with the Zephyr project and that everyone knew going into this project that we we're going to be focusing on safety and security certifications as a goal. And so um, other projects that have been out there for a long time are not likely to be able to you feel like changing a lot of their interfaces and changing the way the developers behave because they've gotten used to that. Um, we are very fortunate. We have a community of developers that is um, understanding that this is a goal and is lining up behind it. And so we'll be working our way through this over the next quarter. And um, we already have some fairly good quality on this on the code base, as you can see by the fact that we're considered good enough for people to start looking into doing investigations on from like the NCC group and others. So um, we've got some academics studying us. We found, you know, various researchers have found issues and helped us fix them. So we certainly welcome anyone who can help us harden this code base up. It's very much appreciated and we'll say thank you. Um, this slide shows our initial focus. These are the modules um, the groups agreed to, um, to do the first minimum viable um, config that we'll be using in a device for going after the 61508 certifications and creating the artifacts associated with it. And as time goes on, we're looking at other scopes of increasing it to different of these modules, like the POSIX API is something that we've had requests to basically start to incorporate into that. And so as we move through this next year um, and pulling this, the um, traceability matrices in place and the testing matrices in place, we'll be basically looking at adding those into. Um, and as we get this first set scope done, then we'll look at figuring out, okay, what are the next ones we can incorporate the same methodologies to and make the same evidence available? Because with Zephyr, um, we have a whole variety of configurations we're going to need to handle from single core MCUs to open AMP support um, with hypervisors, with meshes. There's a lot of different configurations out there that people are going to potentially want to make sure can be used safely in applications, and we're going to be having to consider all that. So, Hence, keeping the scope narrow and small and being able to extend out over time is our approach to trying to make it something that we can get results and it be useful. The, oops, there we go. Our roadmap um, is we're going to be looking at um, finishing off the code um, transitions over to the MISRA compliance this year. And one of our members is looking at doing some work of the versions that are on place right now at some early certifications. And we'll be taking and pulling this in to for next year in 2021, we'll be with the next LTS, we're going to be trying to be ready for taking getting the evidence available. So that's kind of what we're doing um, with Zephyr and the safety space right now. And I think with that, I'd like to introduce the next speaker, uh, Michael, who can tell you a bit more about some of the interesting things that are happening in Zephyr. Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm Michael. I'm coming from Ant Micro, uh, one of the Zephyr project members. And I'll be telling you about uh, how to develop machine learning in MCU with and without hardware, uh, and about the marriage between TensorFlow-Lite and Zephyr. A little bit of introduction to TinyML and TensorFlow Lite. Um, so basically, um, TinyML is, it's even a book, right? But it's a term to, or a name for a community of people that do uh, machine learning in very small footprints. There is a prediction that machine learning will be prevalent. It will be used in all sorts of devices, not just like Linux capable devices, but also things very much smaller. Um, they might or might not have a battery. Um, and of course, uh, the size and complexity of the device that will run this machine learning uh, will limit its capabilities. But uh, there is a claim that the capabilities are pretty good, even for MCUs. You can do gesture recognition. You can do key phrase detection, people counting, all sorts of very interesting and useful things that can pre-qualify your data, uh, you know, increase your security, um, an anonymity of the data, uh, just because you're processing the data closer to their source uh, and you don't have to push the data up and up and up in the stack. You can kind of keep them where they're being gathered. So um, generally speaking, doing machine learning in small devices is a really, really interesting field, rapidly developing. And TensorFlow Lite, you might know from other places, uh, mostly probably from mobile phones. It's a very popular machine learning uh, framework from Google. Uh, it's uh, used at the edge. 
but it also now has an MCU version. It's called TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. Uh, it's been extended to that use case by a team at Google uh, with Pete Warden at the helm. Uh, of course, it's no longer just a Google project. It's actually a, a very collaborative uh, entity. And um, collaborators include Harvard, ARM, our company, and, and a bunch of other people uh, who attend our monthly meetings. Um, I encourage you to join those meetings. They're very open. We have you know, like public notes. Uh, and we have many people collaborating and sharing very good results. Uh, so if you look at uh, how Zephyr kind of stacks up against TensorFlow Lite and why would you want to run those two in tandem, uh, if you can see some similarities between what TFL and, and Zephyr are trying to achieve. Uh, so TensorFlow Lite is not a vendor-driven uh, um, library. It's actually vendor neutral. It targets many devices and many architectures even. So it, it can do, you know, ARM, RISC-V, uh, ARC, and, and, you know, a, a few different architectures uh, out there. Um, so does Zephyr, of course, as, as we've been told just in a few presentations before. Uh, and so if you want to do this machine learning um, applications uh, in this small footprint, you'll probably be churning through a lot of data. And uh, that data comes from sensors, and those sensors need to be accessed in some way. Uh, and to do that, you need drivers, you need uh, APIs, you need libraries. Uh, so you might guess that you know Zephyr is a good match because, as an artist that's you know vendor neutral and driven by the Linux Foundation, uh, it's really good at well handling small MCUs and giving you uh, consistent access to different kinds of hardware. So Zephyr, with its kind of goal to span across all architectures and kind of be really vendor neutral, is an excellent match for TensorFlow Lite because it, it kind of strives to do the same thing. Um, both have a vibrant developer community. I mean, Zephyr, of course, has a bigger one. So for TensorFlow Lite, it's kind of a great opportunity to grow its user base. Uh, but I believe for Zephyr, it's also an opportunity to kind of address uh, very, very interesting and, and hot uh, new use cases uh, and kind of showcase how you know, Zephyr can be used to uh, bring machine learning to even the smallest of devices. So in total, I think it's a very good uh, combination. And our work with uh, Zephyr and Tesla Lite actually began in 2018, so it's been you know, quite a long while. Initially, we just started by helping the Google team, uh, the, the Tesla Lite team, uh, to run uh, Zephyr run, sorry, TensorFlow Lite in simulation on our open source simulation framework on the ARM architecture because they wanted to do testing without hardware. Um, and then uh, we decided that, hey, this is a great framework. Let's try to port it to RISC-V because Micro loves RISC-V and does a lot of things related to that. Uh, and we presented that work at the RISC-V Summit uh, in 2018, uh, late, very late 2018, uh, together with Google. Uh, then uh, the year 2019 brought like an integration, a full-blown integration project between Zephyr and Tesla Lite uh, on RISC-V in an FPGA platform. Uh, so we did that work. The work I'm telling you about today has been performed mostly in late 2019. Uh, only that, you know, it took a while to upstream all this effort, both into Zephyr and then into Tesla Lite. You know, both of those projects have communities. They have their own processes. Uh, they have, uh, you know, uh, a pull request flow to go through. So it took a while to get there, but finally uh, we're there and kind of we can say that uh, TensorFlow Lite has upstream support for Zephyr or vice versa. I don't know which one is closer to the truth. Um, so uh, basically this, this work and results in a very cool uh, blog note uh, that we published on the TensorFlow Lite blog. Uh, it got picked up by, of course, a number of outlets and generated quite a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, we're planning to have academic courses with that content uh, in the fall. Uh, one of the notable entities that reached out is Harvard. We'll see you know, if we can make that happen. Uh, but in general, uh, there's a lot of kind of uh, people picking up Renode uh, because of that and pick up Zephyr and TensorFlow Lite as well uh, uh, together uh, in a pack, so to say. Uh, it's a good match because you know a lot of people are spending their time trying to tinker with different kinds of machine learning activities that don't require extreme resources. They can do so without hardware. Uh, so I'll tell you about how it works in a second. Uh, and currently, we're actually working on quite a lot of new things as well. So we're going to be adding more sensors and more uh, examples like audio detection. 
uh, as well as improving TensorFlow Lite to be better tested in continuous integration using Renode. So I've been mentioning Renode quite a bit and just wanted to give you a bit of background about that. Uh, it is a framework for simulating small systems. Well, not, not only small systems, actually some of the systems being simulated are big too, uh, but many of the platforms that we um, incorporate into Renode are actually Zephyr capable and run Zephyr by default. Um, and some people have been saying things like, hey, Renode looks like Docker for embedded devices, or it's a simulator on steroids. Uh, so both are kind of good approximations of what you can think about Renode is, uh, because it ena enables you this kind of um, streamlined approach to hardware. It enables you to work without the hardware uh, for prototyping. You can also kind of uh, do continuous integration, because if you take hardware out of the equation, uh, you get much more capabilities to reproduce your results or, or build deterministic flows. Um, it's a good match to something like TensorFlow Lite because this library changes a lot. Like machine learning is all about experimenting and developing fast. So if you want to test what you do, um, you need something uh, robust and renodes that. Um, the important thing to know is that we simulate not just the CPU. We simulate sensors, we simulate con connectivity. Uh, there's you know full-blown use cases that you can put into Renode and run them and see what happens. So you can have one sensor reading data from one end, communicate wirelessly to another one, and then the other one, say, does some processing. So you can build complex systems. I think that's kind of what's important to understand. Uh, and of course, again, this multi-platform aspect and the vendor neutrality, uh, we have support for ARM, RISC V, PowerPC, which is, has recently been added. Uh, that's another open source ISA out there. So we're pretty excited about that too. Um, and x86, uh, if you need that. So uh, the complete list of supported boards is in the link in this presentation. The important thing to know is that uh, you know, this is an open source framework, and it comes with uh, demos for all those platforms. And kind of we even give people pre-compiled binaries just so that they can get started very easily and quickly. Uh, so kind of it's a Swiss Army knife of simulation. Uh, just go to reno.io and take a look. And the most important thing that kind of you'll eventually arrive at while using Renode is that you'll see it doesn't only reinforce your local flow. Of course, it, it really helps to, to have a simulator in the local flow when you're just kind of trying to experiment and see what's going on, uh, looking at uh, the platform in detail. Simulation can give you lots of information what's what's happening between hardware and software, especially if things go wrong. But uh, as you go towards a more kind of company-wide deployment scenario or, or continuous integration scenario, that's when uh, Renode becomes really interesting because you can put it on a server, you can run uh, whole suites of tests, you know, randomize those tests and so on. And then um, altogether, kind of this infrastructure will allow you to kind of work together in a team more effectively. That's what we're really aiming for. That's the kind of features we're enabling uh, as a priority so that you can kind of seamlessly transition between your local development environment, the cloud, uh, some kind of a local server, uh, because it's all abstract, right? So you don't need to like connect a board or a hundred boards to, to a server. Uh, it all runs virtually. And the platform that we use for that particular effort is uh, a Digilent RT A7 dev board. It's a low-cost FPGA dev board with a small FPGA on it. Uh, we run a soft system on chip uh, with the RISC-V architecture inside of it. Uh, that work was kind of sponsored by a Google team that was very much into FPGA, so that was a natural choice for us. And we added an accelerometer on a, on a module. It's called PMOD ACL. Uh, and this accelerometer is used to um, you know, detect gestures, basically. Uh, and the interesting thing about it being an FPGA is that FPGAs enable you to accelerate uh, machine learning inside hardware, right? You can dynamically kind of reconfigure the hardware to provide some kind of a machine learning optimization. Uh, so, so this is a kind of very interesting field of research that we're also involved with. And um, what I need to add also in the readout context is that since you can co-simulate uh, FPGAs in Renode, that'll kind of allow you to simulate this entire platform, not just the hard part, not, not just the CPU part, uh but also uh the machine learning accelerator should you develop one you'll be able to just co-simulate between renode and for example verilator 
uh, which is also an open source simulator, but of, of HDL code, of, of FPGA code. Uh, so, so in total, we have a very good platform for developing these kind of things. If you run this demo, I mean, you can you can run it in a self-contained uh, repository. You don't need to do much, really. You can just clone uh, the uh, demo as, as portrayed on the screen and execute this, and you'll just see everything fly by. And eventually, uh, you'll see kind of Renode running uh, those uh, binaries. Uh, there's a couple of interesting features demonstrated. First of all, we're actually kind of adding device models on the fly into Renode uh, in this scenario. So instead of kind of implementing those specific models in mainline Renode, we just kind of added them into that repo and they're compiled on the fly. So you, you can kind of add stuff into Renode without recompiling the framework. Uh, of course, you can also put the, the model back into the framework. That's kind of what we're going to do in the future. Uh, we're also injecting fake data into virtual sensors from files. So that's kind of uh, a pretty neat thing if you need to do different kinds of scenarios, different kinds of perhaps randomized uh, sensor data uh, for testing your machine learning algorithm. Uh, we can do that. You just need some files with the data. They are also provided in this repository. Uh, then we're also running a robot test. Robot is a uh, Python-based testing framework. And um, you can use it to like execute Renode uh as a as a like scripted framework and just get results and see if your tests passed so we defined a bunch of p tests that we wanted to pass and we hope they do and all of that is wrapped into a ci and travis which kind of runs those robot tests uh, so you can see how it's built you can see how you could re use renode for continuous integration in this very example um and if you're really strapped for time like myself uh you could actually just grab this and, and you don't even need to compile the binary. You don't need to wait. There is a pre-compiled binary in the repository. Uh, but of course, you're encouraged to, to kind of go ahead and compile your own and change it and see what happens. It's just for convenience. So yeah, the results are going to be uh, you know circles and, and lines on your screen. Uh, those kind of ASCII symbols represent that a circle was detected. And of course, this is a virtual circle. So this is kind of the data that we injected into Reno to uh, pretend that we're waving the board around and showing it a circle. And of course, the same firmware, the important thing to understand is the same firmware, if you actually put it on the FPGA, if you happen to buy that FPGA or have it at home, uh, plug in this uh, PMOD that's also an off-the-shelf component and run that binary on the FPGA, uh, this will also work, right? So you'll wave that board around, you're going to get the same results. Uh, and uh, here on the right, I have a little screen uh, showing kind of what the CI looks like. So, but you can go ahead and check it out yourself. Uh, going forward, um, we're, of course, adding more platforms. Like we're seeing what the overlap is between TensorFlow Lite and Zephyr and Renode and trying to kind of make them all work. Uh, this one, for example, was added by ARM themselves. So that was pretty cool. They, they kind of issued a pull request to enable STM32 uh, running in Renode. Uh, we're working on more uh, for the course in the fall that I just described and other scenarios. So uh, look out for kind of us adding more. Just as a side note, if you're really interested in developing machine learning on MCUs, which is a very exciting field, um, we're adding some performance analysis tools and, and, and capabilities into Renode. So you will be able to measure, you know, executed instructions and uh, all sorts of other metrics um, inside Renode while you're running your algorithm. And you'll be able to see comparatively whether you're getting better or worse. So that's a very important aspect for continuous integration uh, so that uh, you don't just lose track of what's important. And my last slide is a summary. Uh, so basically now TensorFlow and Lite and, and Zephyr are uh, integrated. So they can play nice. More platforms can, can be integrated. Uh, we're working to build other things on top of what we've already done. As I mentioned, there's some audio related samples we're enabling. And generally speaking, we want to popularize this TinyML, this EdgeML uh, in the Zephyr world and try to get more people to do that. Uh, we hopefully I kind of managed to convince you that Renode can be useful to kind of accelerate the development of that field. Uh, and so if you want to talk about it, you can always 
you know, come to us and talk to us, and we're very happy to hear about your use case. We're gonna like also discuss it uh, if if we're allowed to. We're gonna discuss it, uh, you know, with the TensorFlow team and see how we can enable more interesting scenarios related to machine learning in a very small footprint. So that concludes my presentation. We'll now move to the Q and A session, which I believe is this slide. So we have everyone online. So listen, just before we start with the q and I I want to say a very big thank you to uh, all, uh, all members who've stepped up today to present. It's, uh, it's always a significant commitment. And uh, I never thought I would say this, but virtual platforms are a lot more complicated than real life. That's, uh, that's my commentary so far. The, um, so I, uh, I've actually got a couple of questions and I'm hoping to get some help with the online one. That's the complexity in my eyes. Um, I wanted to come to Kate first. Kate, could you maybe talk to who is on the safety committee? Uh, how do folks get involved? What's the safety committee doing? But who's involved? Sure. Um, so the safety committee is led by Amber Hibbard uh, from Intel. And uh, we meet every two weeks. Um, and so if the, the safety committee, like the security committee, is open to members. Um, if you've got a really strong case uh, for why, please reach out to me or to Amber and we can talk about it. But uh, it's open to members and we pretty much go through what we're doing for the next steps in there. And that's where this, the strategy discussions are happening for it. And we have various other of our Excellent. members uh, putting in. Yeah, thanks. No, that's super. That's super. Um, I would say that the safety committee, um, the way that the Zephyr project is pretty much structured uh, from a board perspective, um, committees get created. It's not an ad hoc process when there is a specialist area, a focused area, um, like safety, like security, then uh, marketing as well. But we, these, these boards, uh, these committees are created, um, and it's yet another way of, of contributing to the project. Um, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to follow up with Michael, um, and maybe I just missed it when you were talking, Michael, but why Zephyr? You guys have had a ton of experience on a ton of platforms, right, over the time. Why Zephyr? An easy question to start you off, but why Zephyr? That's a really cool question. So I can give you a story about how we used Ecos for a quite a long while. Uh, uh, you know, we started in 2009, right? So at that time, uh, there was a bunch of different options, but the, the open source artist landscape just wasn't what it is today, right? If you wanted to choose something that ticked off all the boxes, you were kind of always had to compromise. And Ecos was an operating system, well, still is, right? But uh, uh, an operating system that at that point seemed like a good choice because you know uh, it ticked off those boxes of POSIX compliance and like standardization and mm. uh, being used across lots of different scenarios because it, it addressed both small and big devices. You could scale it up. It had a nice configuration framework uh, that you could use to kind of trim it down or, or build it up. We used it for quite a long while. Uh, and of course, we used other systems when people asked. Like We worked with a lot of open source solutions throughout the years, uh, free artists and so on. Uh, but but Ecos kind of always was frustrating in terms of like liveliness and community. Like there wasn't anything really happening besides what we were doing and a bunch of other guys. And um, part of it is because it was controlled by a single entity. There was an eco. I, I think there still is an eco-centric company that um, you know wants to sell you a pro version of it. So it's it's always this situation where. Um, uh, there's this uh, uh, problem of uh, vendor neutrality that creeps in. Uh, so when we saw Zephyr in its early days being established and kind of donated from Intel and Wind River and kind of established as a really kind of vendor neutral community centric operating system and also kind of addressing all of those issues that we had had where we needed something that would be like POSIX compliant and targeting various use cases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We decided, okay, Zephyr is the thing. We we need to join that. We need to support this. So and it, it proved to be a great choice. Uh, um, you know, there's there's a few other interesting choices out there as well, and you know, they're they're great things. But uh, only Zephyr kind of achieves all of those things at the same time, including the community aspect of it. The um, good answer. 
the um, and I just want to say for everyone who's uh, listening to the Q and A, no, nobody got these questions in advance. So uh, thank you, thank you, Michael. It's it's really good to get more of a user perspective. Okay, um, we're we're sitting in the project. That's one view, but you you're outside seeing the big wide world. So when you make a choice, that has to be an active choice. Um, and I should have said I I really want to get Reno added to our board slide. Right, that, that's that was my one takeaway from listening to you earlier. The um, Kate, we had a question in there about Zen. Uh, are you considering certifying configuration using Zen? Can you give me an opinion on that one? Um, I think there is, I'd say yes, there's been discussions about it. I think we're going to need to work with the Zen community a bit more. Um, I'm actually sitting on the Zen safety uh, committee as well. And um, I think that eventually, there's time over time. I'm expecting that we will probably do something in that direction. It's a question of who wants to be there and participating more. Ah, uh, I, I just think that participation volunteer word comes up a lot, but it's good. It's good. No, Let's no, keep this I going, know, right? Yeah, we, um, interested in this, and I know there's like I say, I've, I've talked to several that are interested. It's just a question of okay, how do we make it happen? <laughs> No, the um, that is a good answer, and and again, how do we make it happen? That's that's uh, that's super. I'm going to go to David. Um, David, we had a question here about Zephyr support for TEE. Could you take that? Could you take that? Sure thing. Um, and I'm assuming that this is trusted execution environment, and it's not I clear from the question the, whether you mean something specific like global platform, or just the general mm -hmm. concept of a trusted execution environment, because the at least the current global platform spec kind of requires a little bit more out of systems than what Zephyr's targets are usually focused at. Um, so what I do know, uh, there is support in progress for Zephyr working with the Trusted Firmware M project, which is kind of basically the equivalent of that for the Cortex M type target. I know there's a little bit of other efforts as far as supporting other kinds of trusted execution environments on other platforms, but unfortunately I'm not familiar enough to really be able to answer the question. I guess the simple answer to the question is there is some some support in there. There's work, definitely work being done on that. I, I can fill in a little bit at least in the RISC-V sure. context yes. because uh, yes. Yes, please. there's an effort from RISC-V, from, sorry, from SIX or RISE in Sweden to implement the Keystone Enclave in Zephyr, um, which is a trusted execution environment from the RISC-V world. I, it, I don't know whether it's actually kind of constrained to just running on RISC-V. Uh, I don't know enough about it to, to, to say uh, confidently, but I know that the effort is very well underway and uh, we've actually just been asked to review the code and kind of help merge it into Zephyr. So there's definitely m multiple activities of different kind of TEEs going on. Okay, I um I, I made the same assumption as David. <coughs> Excuse me, I made the same assumption as David at the start of that question. But uh, the um okay now in terms of uh, Martin, um, BLE certification around Zephyr. Um, what is the status of BLE certification around Zephyr? I'm even asking that question. Well, that's an interesting question to to ask me. Um. I think probably someone from the Zephyr team would be better able to tell you the, the status there. Um, obviously, you guys submit specific releases, I guess, of Zephyr to go through the certification process. You submit your test results. Um, and I, I don't personally manage that rather large list of products that go through that process, I'm afraid. So um, I don't know I if, could believe if that's, that's what you mean. Actually. I mean, my understanding is that a number of specific versions of Zephyr have been qualified already. So I think um, one of the relatively early ones, correct me, I can see Kate's there. She's going to bail me out here. Is it uh, 1.4, was it, or something? Is that the first one that, uh, yeah. yeah, I think that's the first one that achieved kind of broad. Yeah. The, the qualification process is somewhat modular. So I think 1.4 is the one I tend to use because that's got broad yeah. uh, qualification of the various parts, controller and host, uh, and including mesh. And uh, from what I saw on the web page on the Zephyr site, there are a few um, kind of specific cases that have achieved certification in other versions as well. The thing for people to do there who are looking to use Zephyr 
for a Bluetooth enabled device is to, is to look at the documentation on the Zephyr website because that will tell you the answer to, to that question. I hope that's right. I think you did not bad. Qualification is really my, my subject, I must confess. The, um, <laughs> Excellent. I like to be. One, well, one that uh, we've gotten the, the QC bids on. And so that's sitting in the release notes yeah. for 114.1 and 114. Okay. I, the, I, um, I think you did perfectly well. You did you did perfectly well, Martin. And Kay, as <laughs> usual, comes to the rescue. Um, <laughs> yeah. Do you know, it's uh, the purpose and reasoning, actually, and I apologize for that, but the purpose and reasoning is um, it's this functionality perspective um, and having the functionality. But uh, we got to the we got to it in the end, right? If somebody's yeah, interested in BLE certification, go check thing, the CEFR documentation. The key thing is that the, with the exception of the Bluetooth BREDR, the very old version of Bluetooth, um, everything pretty much you could ever want to do, I think you'll find there's a qualified version of Zephyr that supports that. So predominantly that's Bluetooth peripheral devices and Bluetooth mesh products. You should be able to find a, a version of Zephyr that supports that. Support for Bluetooth is really okay. good in Zephyr. Well, Martin, I never paid you to say that. Well done. They are, that, that was all you needed to say right at the start, right? <laughs> the, um... <laughs> <laughs> the, well, uh, this is a mic. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I am of course it's on a volunteer basis. The, um, <laughs> um, Michael, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to I'm going to ask you a question on it. Does Renode allow to integrate emulated network of devices with a real device network? We're looking for a way to test a few real devices running Zephyr, simulating a, a larger network of emulated devices. Yeah. yeah, it it absolutely does. Uh, yes, yes, it absolutely does. It'll uh, basically one thing you'll lose is determinism because you're connecting the real world to the simulated world, mm -hmm. and the real world is not deterministic. Uh, so it might be a big a bit of a challenge in some scenarios. Also, you'll have to kind of make sure that the timing's correct because the real world is expecting things to happen in a specific time frame. Uh, so you know, if your simulation is not fast enough, then you're gonna miss some windows and so on. But in general, yes, we've done that. We've connected real nodes with simulated nodes in the past, and uh, it's absolutely possible. It's a kind of a use case that we want to enable too. Uh, the devil's in the details, of course. But we're happy to hear more, and kind of if you tell us what you want to do, we'll tell you honestly if if it's a good idea or not. The um, thank you, Michael. I have. Uh, I think this one's probably for Marty. Um, just since he thought he was going to escape. The um, running git log minus s, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> running git log minus s renode on the Zephyr git repository yields two findings. What is hindering a broader adaption? Actually, uh, now I think it's back to Michael. That, that's back to me. I know which one you meant with Marty because <laughs> I, I saw that question beforehand and that's a good one. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, like, it's the same like people could ask, why did you develop Redo in the first place? Uh, which would be an hour long story. So I, fortunately I didn't get that question. Um, the, the, the other one is easier to answer. So why is uh, Renode not kind of integrated tightly into the Zephyr repository? I guess the only reason is uh, just time and maintenance effort. Uh, Renode is a simulator, so you can run any software in it. You can run Zephyr, but so can you run anything else, mm -hmm. bare metal or other operating systems. Uh, so kind of you could argue that integrating it into Zephyr in this way it wouldn't necessarily be uh, uh, such a good idea. Given the fact, of course, that Zephyr does come with its own testing infrastructure and so on, I actually think it would be a good idea. We just need to do it. We just need to kind of uh, get back to that topic because we did do that at one point to some extent. Then, you know, the Zephyr testing group kind of disintegrated and appeared again, surfaced again. But at that time, we were just too busy with other things and we didn't kind of join the regular meetings. We have to do it again. and. Uh, I'll talk about Renode there. So long story short, um, no time. But in general, there are external integrations between Renode and Zephyr. For example, Platform IO um, has done a really good job uh, just kind of uh, putting Renode and Zephyr together uh, in their own kind of uh, build framework, whatever you call it, uh, so that you can grab Zephyr and then simulate that in Renode, assuming there's support for the platform. 
Thank you very much, Michael. Yes, I started reading that and then I realized I was changing tracks. Um, I think this might be coming. I didn't see this question. Is it possible to run Zephyr with TensorFlow on a KL46Z MCU? Um, uh, Michael, off the top of your head, that's rather a specific question, but the, um, yeah, do you happen uh, to know? <laughs> Let me, let me see the question I'm because see. I'm bad at yeah, it's, uh, I, 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 yeah. I'm actually I'm actually going to see who's on. Probably not, probably not. But I can I can double check, of course, for you. Also, there might be some work yeah. in progress I'm not aware of. So, yeah, I think that's uh, that's highly that's highly possible. The um, well, listen, I'm, I want to just go very quickly around the panel. We've got about six minutes left. And uh, so I'm going to, I'm giving you a fair warning panel, right? I'd just like you to give me um, what's the what's your personal next steps with Zephyr, okay? And um, what's your either your group doing? What purpose are you doing, David? You're 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 the first in order, okay? This is not alphabetical. This is by screenshot, um, David. When you go back to work in Zephyr, when you go back to work with the security committee, what's what's the next steps for you? Ah, oh, fun question. Um... <laughs> Part of it, I think the next thing I'm going to do is update the documentation for some of the things that we d recently discussed within the, the security team to make our documentation look a little bit better. Um, an unrelated task that I'm going to look into that I just thought of while some of the West presentation was happening is I'm going to look at what it takes to build an application in Rust on top of Zephyr. Not really related to the security uh -huh. team, but sort of. So, goodness, goodness, you see what happens when you ask people on the spot, right? That's when the interesting stuff starts to come out. If you <laughs> don't mind me saying so, David. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Now I'm going. I'm going diagonal, Marty. When you go back to Zephyr, what are you doing? Yeah. So one of the things that I sort of just wrapped up for Zephyr 2.3 is I was helping out with the new device tree API. So Zephyr uses device tree for uh, hardware description and um, we made a bunch of changes from 2.2 to 2.3. So there's a, new, there's, a, there's a new API which is hopefully gonna be stable from now on. Um, and uh, at my company, we use Zephyr as the basis for our SDK. And so there's a kind of a big move right. from kconfig to device tree that I'm gonna be working on as a follow-up work. Well, you know what? We think that's an extremely good thing to do as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. Kate, you've just got too many things to do, but could you pick one or two of your faves, yeah. right? Well, actually, the one that just occurred to me as we I was listening to Marty talk is um, you've got a manifest flow for West, and I think I want to see if we can work on turning that into an automatically generated software build materials because I think we're actually pretty close. So you may be seeing me in your inbox a bit on that one, because we're going to need to have accurate uh, descriptions of all the um, components and the options and so forth from the safety perspective. So let's see if we yeah. can start getting that one knocked out now. Hit me <laughs> okay. up. At me. Okay. Yeah, How you heard it here first. <laughs> That was Marty. Uh, Marty got so surprised he almost put his microphone back down, but then he thought he better not. The, um, the, uh, Okay, now Martin, I'm coming to you, but I'm leaving you to the end, right? Okay, so oh. you get you get pre preparation time here. Okay, so Michael, what's next for for Renode and Micro and Zephyr? What's next? I think a tighter integration in Zephyr. I have to say that because you know the question that was in the Q and A. Yes, you do. <laughs> 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 well, you know what? We're big like fans. We're big fans of what you guys yeah. do, right? So, but if yes. I if I may the, um, say I, kind I, of I, one broader thing that I didn't refer please. to, uh, we're kind of working a lot with you know open source ASIC design and and this kind of stuff. So, what I'm hoping for is to get you know Zephyr running on a fully open source chip in the nearest future. Uh, we've done a system and package uh, uh, design late last year. And that of course runs Zephyr because what else? Uh, but I'd love to do like a full end-to-end -end open source chip and run Zephyr on it. Wow! Now that you know what that's, uh, I am. Um, uh, I, I do have such a foot in both camps in terms of open source software and open source hardware. Um, when I hear you say the word Risk Five, it makes me all perk up. And then when I hear the word Zephyr, it's just it's just a natural a natural pairing. The um, look forward to it. And last but certainly not least, Martin. What technical thing are you looking forward to doing in Zephyr next? I'm looking forward to seeing um, what newer Bluetooth features emerge in 
Zephyr, uh, uh, in particular, nice. some of the features from Bluetooth 5.2, um, which was released early this year. Uh, isochronous channels is a fascinating capability the new version has. Um, and on top of that, uh, the new Bluetooth low energy based audio technology, uh, which we announced earlier this year, it's not really been fully released yet. Um, but with isochronous channels in Zephyr, you set the scene for a whole generation of wireless audio products with all sorts of new capabilities that Bluetooth today doesn't have in the world of audio, audio sharing, audio in conferences, cinemas, multi content streaming, different languages simultaneously, all sorts of amazing things, all built on this isochronous right. channels capability with a new codec. So um, I don't know if anyone's working on that because obviously we're not actually involved in Zephyr at all. We're a kind of neutral standards organization. Um, but, you know, I lie awake at night hoping that this is going to happen. So. <laughs> Do you know what? Do you know what, uh, Martin? With the community we've got uh, building, I think I can fairly guarantee you that someone is working in Zephyr um, with those no extremely, uh, extremely neat features. So the, um, but uh, okay. Well, listen. Um, I, uh, I actually do have a prompt here that says that if folks want to move on to Slack channel uh, two, uh, the track open source project updates. Um, anyway, thanks to the panel. Thanks to everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, guys. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks, John. Thanks, people. Cheers, guys. Thanks, John. Thanks, Arthur.